We work for the Recycle Right program at the Southern Metropolitan Regional Council. And today we're here at our materials recovery um, facility at the RRRC, which is the resource the Regional Resource Recovery Centre in Canningvale. Behind us you can see um, hopefully all the machinery and this is where um, a lot of people's waste from their yellow top bins comes to be sorted and processed. So over to Jared to introduce us. Yes, so funnily enough that, that actually also includes um, so Melbourne, Fremantle and the City of Canning. So that is all of your recyclable waste that you can see in the background. Uh, so thanks thanks everyone for joining us today it's really awesome we've got three different schools we've got leaving senior high school john curtin and we've got uh, linwood senior high school as well um so yeah today we're going to be busting some waste myths uh we're going to be talking about the waste export bans that are happening um, in australia from next year onwards um, we're also joined by some awesome waste experts um, today so we're joined by Rebecca Brown from Walga. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Walga is, that's the West Australian Local Government Association. Uh, we're also joined by Brendan Doherty. Um, I'm not sure if you want to step in and say hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Brendan's also from our um, Southern Metropolitan Regional Council. And we're also joined by Scott McKenzie, um, who works at DWA. So for those of you who don't know what uh, DWA is, again, that's the uh, West Australian Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. Uh, so basically how it will work today, our, our lovely guests will give a presentation and you can type in questions uh, during the presentations, but we've, you know, we'll keep you on mute. Um, but afterwards we'll, we'll allow time for discussion, we'll unmute everyone and we can have some more questions being asked as well. Um, I think that's everything in terms of housekeeping. Maybe. Starting off, we're gonna be going to Rebecca Brown. So Rebecca, if you'd like to share your presentation. Yeah. All right, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's fantastic not to be able to see you. Um, but I can see your teachers, okay. so that, that's hopefully enough. I can see the reflection, um, so please feel free to wave during your presentation. You guys are way more enthusiastic than most of the people I talk to, so um, that's really awesome to see. Um, I've been working at the WA Local Government Association since, since 2003, so I've been doing waste uh, longer than most of you have been alive, I think. Um, so uh, I do talk a lot of rubbish and I will try and scatter my presentation with fun anecdotes and facts about waste. Um, the main myth I'm going to be talking about is that people know how to recycle. Um, recycling is really important and it's really like there's a lot of people who are promoting it and doing fantastic education on it like the SMRC. Um, but unfortunately not everybody knows how to use their recycling bin right and that really leads to some issues. So. Um, if I could get uh, a bit of an indication, teachers, um, do you have bins at home? The teachers I can see on the screen. If you do, yep, you have bins at home. All, all, all of the kids in your class, they, they're going to have bins at home as well. So you, you're already a bit knowledgeable about waste management. You, you're doing it on a daily basis. Um, so this will be a very sort of familiar view. You, you look down the street and you see all the bins nicely out there ready to be collected. Um, and if you're a bit of a waste nerd, you're also um, a member of the Bin Isolation Outing Facebook group and you uh, look at pictures of people dressing up to put out their bins, because um, what else do you do in lockdown? So um, local governments provide a, a range of waste services across WA and curbside collection is, is one of the ones that everyone would be really, really familiar with. Um, the, the material that's collected through your recycling bin at the curbside is, is sorted by a combination of people and machinery. Why that's really important is everything that goes in the curbside bin can't necessarily be recycled. So we have to make sure we sort out all of the things that, that can't be recycled. Um, so this is just an example. You've got workers there and they're picking out the different kinds of materials. So they pick out the contamination as well and they're trying to make sure that recycling is as clean as possible. Um, here's an example of some of the machines um, and they're really complicated and they're all specially designed to sort out what's in your recycling bin. Um, so the idea that recycling just goes somewhere and it sort of magically gets separated out and up, there's people and there's machines involved in that process. Um, have, have you guys had lunch yet? 
No. Oh, that's good. All right. Well, because I'm going to show some some quite unpleasant pictures of what people put in their recycling bins. Um, so, but first, um, what happens to the recycling once it's been sorted is it's bailed up and um, then it's either sent overseas to be recycled or it's recycled here in WA. Um, that's just curbside recycling. Now, when you're looking at that big bale of paper there, that's a commodity. That's just like iron ore or anything else that people are digging out of the ground. And as with any commodity, you want it to be as clean as possible um, and you want it to be as high value as possible because the, the cleaner it is, the better, the more money you get for it. Um, and therefore, the cheaper the recycling service can be because you're, you're getting value out of your curbside recycling. So it's really important to remember everything you put into your curbside recycling bin um, is potentially a commodity and that's what's going to happen to it. It's going to get sorted out, it's going to get compacted up into a bale if it's paper or cardboard or aluminium or plastic and then it's going to be sent somewhere else um, to be recycled back into a new product. So we really need to make sure that we reduce contamination in the curbside bin because if we have a nice clean product we get more money for it and it can be recycled better. So um, I'm going to talk about some of the, the common, um, common mistakes people make um, because they, they don't know what to do with their recycling. So this is an example of um, recycling is, the is tied up in a plastic bag. So the reason that that's a problem is that bag might be full of recycling, but no one's going to open that bag because they don't know what's in it. So when it gets to the material recovery facility, the workers are just going to take that off and it will go to landfill. If that material was loose in the recycling bin, it will probably be recycled. But if you tie things up in a bag, they're not going to be recycled. So it's really important to have the um, recycling loose in the bin. Then there's things that you just shouldn't put in the bin. So those are nappies. Um, uh, and that's more common than you think. Um, so, yep, I, I love the expression there. Um, yep, it's gross. Um, <laughs> Uh, so part of my work, we do a lot of um, bin inspection. So we get up really early in the morning and we look in people's bins and we give them feedback using things like bin tags. So it's a little happy face um, or a little sad face on your bin, depending on what, what's in it. Um, but the reason that this is a problem is because um, first and foremost, people are sorting that waste. And that's really horrible that they have to deal with, with dirty nappies. Um, the nappies aren't recyclable, unfortunately. So. Uh, what happens is they, um, they get taken out and they go to landfill or sometimes if they don't get taken out, they get compacted in with all of that paper and then potentially that material is exported. Um, so it's really important that we don't have things like nappies um, in, in, the, in the bin. Then um, you get other kinds of contamination. So this is an example from where we were doing bin inspections and we were giving people feedback. So in this bin there are nappies, there are bags full of food. Really, um, that household's just kind of used the, um, the recycling bin as a bit of a waste bin. Um, and again, it means that lots of that are those materials, they can't be recycled because they're all contaminated. So, as I said, it's really important that we only keep the, the basic recyclable materials in the bin and that we try and reduce contamination because it impacts on worker health and safety. It impacts on the value of our commodities and sometimes it impacts on the machinery as well. Um, so things like cables and hoses, while well, they could be recycled maybe in a different way, they can't be recycled through the curbside bin. And what happens with the things like cables and clothing and um, uh, tie down straps, th things like that, they get tangled up in that machinery I showed earlier. And that means the entire plant has to be shut down so that, that those tangles can be removed and that costs a lot of money. Um, the Southern Metropolitan Regional Council, they estimated that stopping their machinery to untangle things cost them about $150,000 a year in downtime. So that was time their facility couldn't operate. So that's, that's why it's really important. Things like that, they can impact on how the machines work. And then you have situations where people put flammable things in their curbside recycling bin. Uh, and what happens is that sets the, sets the truck on fire. So when um, a recycling truck picks up your, your bin, it empties it into the hopper at the back and then it compacts it, so it squashes it. And you've got metal plates squashing the, the waste or the recycling down. Um, with metal, you can, when metal rubs together, you can get a spark. So if someone puts um, a battery or a flare or a gas bottle um, or something like that, something flammable or an aerosol into the back, into their recycling bin, if it goes into the recycling truck and it gets squashed and broken and there's a spark, you can end up with a fire. Um, and the fires now are so common, there's even a term in the industry, they're called hot loads. 
Um, and all, all that the, the driver can do is dump that material out on a road and then they have to call the fire brigade to put it out. So as you can see, um, sometimes people don't quite put the right things in the bin and there can be a lot of impacts. Those impacts are environmental, they're potentially impacts um, on people as well, and they're certainly economic impacts because all of those things cost money. Um, but the other speakers are going to talk a bit more about the export ban and, and what, where that's come from and what that's going to look like. Um, but one of the reasons that you know, this export ban has happened is because unfortunately our recycling has been contaminated in the past and we have been sending contaminated material overseas. Um, so we need to really make sure that we do our best at home, that the material is as clean as possible when it goes into the bin and that means that it will be sorted out and it can be recovered. Um, so I only had, that was my presentation, but I'm very happy to take questions. And if you don't have any questions, that's equally fine. Oh, no, 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 oh. Um, so when we put uh, bottles and tin cans and that sort of stuff into a recycling bin, should we be removing labels? Um, labels are okay. That's a really good question. I can tell you're a dedicated recycler because only people who really, um, you know, are into it are ask those type of questions. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about the labels on the bottles. Just make sure, and, and the cans, just make sure that the lids are off and that um, you've given the containers a quick rinse. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. Alrighty, so our next expert guest today will be Brendan Doherty from the SMRC. So we're just gonna pull up the presentation here now. Awesome, we're good to go. All right, thanks, Jared. I might just adjust the screen a little bit. So hopefully, hopefully you can see the uh, MRF in the background and hi, hi again to everyone and welcome along. Um, I've also been in the industry for a long time, been about 20 years here at um, the Regional Council and I was involved in the original construction and ongoing operation of this facility. And if you haven't been here at Canning Vale, hopefully one day you can come along and have a look and, and go for a bit of a tour. So. Um, Anyway, I'm just going to talk about what we do here and um, some of the issues around uh, this impending ban on exports. Um, so just um, in terms of the SMRC, we currently have four member councils, uh, Fremantle, East Fremantle, Melville and Quinana. And um, we have around about 187,000 people living uh, in about 77,000 households. And uh, we've recently rolled out a three bin system, which is a red bin for general waste, a um, yellow bin for recycling and a lime top bin for FOGO. And if you live in uh, Fremantle, East Fremantle or Melville, uh, then you may well have a three bin system at the moment. So this facility where we are at Canning Vale, um, it's, it's located down just off South Street near the, uh, near the big markets there. And uh, there's, three main facilities. Um, there's a, a, what we call an MRF, which is where we are here today. It's a materials recovery facility, and that's where all of your yellow top uh, bin material comes to. We also have a general green waste facility, which is for stuff we come and pick up off your verge, or if you want to drop something off um, with a trailer or whatever, we, we can take your garden waste as well for that, which we turn into mulch. And then we have this large other facility called a waste composting facility, and that's where we um, send all the FOGO material, which is food waste and, and green waste in the same, same bin. And that's where we uh, process that to make compost. Uh, we also have other facilities such as um, auditing uh, and maintenance where we, we can go in and, and uh, look in what people, what people are actually putting into their bins to actually give some feedback in terms of um, 
what they should or shouldn't be doing. So just looking at the different uh, types of bins, as I said, the yellow top goes here to the MRF or the MRF, and that's the plastic, paper, cardboard, metals and aluminium. And pretty much most of that currently is shipped into Southeast Asia. Um, glass is processed in WA, and um, it used to be processed actually in Perth, and then in Adelaide, but we no longer have a, a glass bottle plant in Perth, so the, all the glass is currently crushed and turned into a sand type material, which is used then in construction. Uh, but everything else, uh, typically your, your metals, your plastics, your paper and cardboard is shipped into Asia. Um, with the waste composting facility, as I said, we, we, we turn that into compost. We're currently upgrading our plant and, and the composting is currently being, doing out, being done out towards 2J. Um, and uh, that material is actually being sold back into the Perth market. So you can actually buy that compost um, in a range of outlets around Perth. Um, and the red bin, which is a general waste, which is everything which is left over, which ideally would have no food or garden or recyclables in it. We currently send that out to a site run by Suez, which is uh, about an hour southeast of Perth. And that's essentially a landfill. And um, that's basically covered over, and then they extract methane and produce electricity. We're also um, we're also going to be sending it in the future to a dedicated uh, plant to extract energy from their waste, which is located in Quinan, and that's that's going to happen in about about a year or so from now. Now the different types of plastics um, that we separate into here, we do into basically three streams, there's actually four, but I'll go through the three. One is what we call PET, which is like your Coke bottles and water bottles, which is clear plastic. Um, also includes uh, punnets and clamshells that you might have fruit in. And um, we sell that, um, the prices range, they, they can vary quite a lot, but typically the average price we've got there is around $375 a tonne, but it can go up above that and, and below that. And um, that can be made into, it can actually be made back into Coke bottles um, or it can be used to, to make fibre. And so some of the clothing that you buy might, might, might have cotton on it, but it actually may well be made out of PET. Uh, it can also make uh, automotive part, parts and whatnot. So the other, the other category is HDPE, which is the opaque, sort of clear plastic, uh, which you would have in milk bottles or juice bottles. And, um, and again, that, that can be used to make those um, type of bottles again, but it also can be used for general plastic products, crates, pipes. Um, some of the HDPE that we sell into Asia actually ends up in Japan and they make car bumpers out of it. Uh, in Japan, that's a common use of HDPE. And then the other category we have is after we separate those two categories, everything which is left over is a mixture of all the other types of categories. So anything from uh, um, some type of milk bottles, um, things with sauce and yogurt and those kind of things in a range of uh, plastics. That has a lower price um, because, it, because it's a mixed product. And that's typically sort of under $100 a tonne at the moment. And again, that can go into it wouldn't necessarily go into making bottles for foodstuffs, but it would definitely go into industrial parts, you know, crates and clothing and um, pipes and that kind of thing. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So just a bit of a background. Um, if you've heard a bit about the ban that China has imposed, it's something which has been building up over the last seven years or so. And the first thing they came out with back in 2013 is they decided uh, they're going to they're going to come up with a thing called Operation Green Fence, which was to um, try and prohibit unwashed and contaminated recyclable materials, um, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do because in Australia, we don't accept anything of that manner at all. You can't import uh, material that um, consumers have used, which hasn't been washed. We only import perfectly clean new materials or, or reprocessed materials. So what they're doing is perfectly fine to address the issue around uh, some of the materials that we've been exporting. So you can see on the timeline, they've progressively um, 
increased um, their legislation. They came out in 2017 with, with a thing called National Sword. And then ultimately in 2018, they came out with a thing called Blue Sky where they've actually decided once and for all that they're not going to accept uh, any sort of contamination above half a percent. Whereas typically um, you could have contamination or non-recyclables in the export of plastics around five or ten percent. We probably run under five percent, but um, to achieve a zero point five percent contamination level or less, it needs a different approach um, in Australia to the way that we deal with um, recyclable plastics. And you can see there's been a number of things that's happened in Australia in reaction to it. And the main thing is that. Um, Council of Australian Governments has, has agreed to, to stop exporting plastic over, over the next four years. So we all have to change what we do um, to, to, to address this new situation. So there's different things that we can do um, as, as an MRF um, processing things. We can actually change the way we process to make sure we do a better separation and we, and we get more of the different types of grades of plastic, and that can be, can be as simple as just slowing down the process and taking more time, maybe more people to help sorting. Uh, but essentially, to address this, what, what we need is, um, we need to be able to process the material in Australia to produce a clean product, so either use in Australia or then to send the clean product overseas. And to support that sort of opportunities now that we have are grants from uh, federal and state governments and also from private industry to invest in uh, new technologies and plants um, within Australia. We also have a thing called Containers for Change which is coming in uh, in a few weeks and that's also known as Container Deposit and that's where you can take your used containers back to a, to a depot and you can get 10 cents back for your containers. You may well have heard for this, heard about this. It's, it's for particular containers uh, things like aluminium cans and mainly beverage type containers and some some flavored milk containers so you'll hear more, hear more about this in in the media but that's another way of taking clean containers back to a point so that we can actually recycle them okay so um, in terms of what people can do in their recycling behavior the main things are to re remove the lids and rebecca touched on this uh, previously also give your containers a, a quick rinse, flatten all your cardboard boxes and don't put anything in bags. Because the way that we separate things here at this MRF, it's, there's, there's, there's two basic ways that we separate. One is on the shape of, of the material. So anything which is flat typically is paper or cardboard and there's a special screen which takes that off. And anything which is, is uh, three dimensional or round, we, you, we actually, um, cause it to roll backwards. So that's mainly all your, your containers, okay? So what we need to do, if you have something made of paper or cardboard, it should be flat. If it's a container, then it should be as round as possible. Okay, so there, and that helps us to separate things uh, better at the MRF. And also anything obviously, which is not recyclable, and you can look on the Recycle Right website, all those things there, aerosol cans, batteries, you know, nappies, uh, you know, clothing, all that sort of stuff. There's other ways you can deal with that. So we need you to, to do that. And also just generally, if you can avoid buying plastic, just, just don't buy plastic. That's probably the best, the best message um, of all. All right, well, that's pretty much all I had to say. So we're happy to take some questions. Thanks, Brendan. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yep. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, how long has the facility in Canning Vale been running for? And then, like, where was all the um, where was the facility like based beforehand? Okay. So this this facility um, is twenty years old, and prior to that, most of the recyclables in our region was processed in Fremantle. So there was a company called Recycling Company of WA, and they actually had a facility um, in North Fremantle. And that same company actually built the first version of this here today. We now op operate it ourselves and we've gone through a number of changes, but it's basically 20 years old. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've got one more if that's all right. Um, what do you do with the plastic once you've received it? So all the plastic, like the milk cartons and the water bottles and things. Oh, what, oh sorry, what do people do with it when, once they buy it? Like you can buy a pallet. Do they do it, um, do they burn it for electricity? Do they try and upcycle it? What, what do they do with the, these pallets of um, waste? Oh, okay, so once, once, once we've, um, we actually put it into a bale. Um, so each bale is about a, a metre by a metre by a metre and weighs about half a tonne. That goes into sea containers and that gets exported to various markets. And, and this material, because it's, um, we actually sell it for quite a high value, it then has to be transported from here to Fremantle on a truck and then it has to go on a ship to Asia, so you can appreciate someone has spent quite a bit of money on this material. They then have to sell that material to a third party who will use it typically to make other plastic products. So it, it, it's highly unlikely that the main plastic material that we're selling is used in waste to energy. Um, it's, it's used to make more plastic materials. As I, and I gave some examples. One is that HDPE is used in car parts. Uh, PTE can be used to make new PET bottles or, or clothing. And the mixed, the mixed plastics, because it's a mixed polymer, tends to be used to make more things like, uh, say, a plastic crate or, some, or, or a washing basket, that kind of thing. Um, perhaps explain about shredding or making into pallets. Um, so, part of the, so part of the process, uh, which, which we may end up doing here in Perth, is um, to get it clean, they typically will shred shred the material down and then it can be colour separated using optical sorters and then washed washed so there's no residue on it um, and then that that material can be turned into either for a flake or into pellets and then that that is ready then to go straight to a factory and fed into an extrusion machine to make to make new products any other questions oh, thank you Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so heading over to Linwood, Linwood Senior High School. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> okay, guys, do we want to ask anything? Can we think of anything to ask? Um, I'd like to ask one question. Um, how much of waste do you think is going to go to the waste energy plant in Quinana? And if we dropped out for about a minute, so we may have missed this, but we, we, there is a waste to energy plant being built in Quinana at the moment. How important do you think that's going to be in the next five, ten years? It is designed to take up to about 400,000 tonnes per annum, which is If you do your separation pro properly, there should only be about 15% of material going there. They'll also be sourcing um, material from commercial uh, waste generators as well. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, that's good. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll in your high school. Any questions from Leeming? It's on you. Hi, we're just wondering how long the um, the recycling plant is going to be viable for. So into the future, how long is Fremantle, East Fremantle, Melbourne going to continue to put their waste into the recycling plant and what other options there are for that recycling? Okay, so um, the current plant in the configuration that you can see, um, this was constructed, was actually commissioned in 2012, so it's still a, a relatively new plant. Generally, a uh, plant might operate for about 20 years, so it's probably coming up to about half its usable life. Um, so all that, all that will really happen is, um, new, as new technology comes in, it will, it will improve the way that we separate um, the materials and the efficiency of separation. 
Um, and for example, one of the techniques we use is optical sorting. So for plastics in particular, we have scanners which scan the, the materials on a belt and then a jet of air actually sends the different plastics in different directions. So that's, that's the kind of technology that we're using and that's only going to, going to improve over time. So I don't really see, for as long as we have mixed material in a bin, uh, we're still going to need this kind of technology going into the future. Thank you. I'm um, just wondering, I'm oh, sorry, um, we missed the first part because I was having um, uh, audio problems. Um, I was just wondering if you mentioned at the start, what kind of um, pollution benefit um, the recycling plant has? So if we're not using a recycling plant like this, what kind of, what's our carbon emissions and what, what environmental impact we would have without doing this recycling? Okay. Yes. Um, Sorry. <laughs> there has been there has been quite a lot of bit of work on that. I, I know I can quote you, for example, our other plant, which is the organics plant, which processes um, food and garden waste. We actually generate carbon credits from that, and the rate of generation is for about every ton we we produce about half a ton of, of carbon abatement. But for for a um, a plant such as a recycling plant, it's going to be much higher because um, the, well, the abatement's gonna be much higher because you're dealing with products like aluminium, where there's a lot of efficiency in, in uh, reusing aluminium cans and the same with plastic because they're oil-based uh, materials and also with paper. So I don't have the figure off the top of my head, but there's definitely a massive benefit in uh, recycling materials and composting them as opposed to going to landfill. Thank you. Okay, we'll um, we'll move on, Jared. Yep. Sure. All right, thanks for that, Brendan. Okay, so last but not least, we're gonna head over to our, our final guest for the day, uh, Scott McKenzie. If you could please share your screen. Perfect. Awesome, thanks, Scott. G'day everyone, I hope that's working. Thumbs up if it's working. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> G'day everyone. Hey, have, have, so have we got everyone um, in their lunch break at the moment? Is that what's going on? No, good, I was gonna say that. Uh, I thought, I thought that, that was pretty committed if everyone was um, sacrificing their lunch break for this thing. So um, welcome and, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, my name's Scott McKenzie. I uh, work for the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation. And um, one of my, well, my job is to really help the uh, department and an organisation called the Waste Authority um, to implement um, the state's waste strategy. And um, so basically, we're, we're trying to help um, everyone reduce the amount of waste that's generated and um, increase recycling as much as we can. Um, because uh, as, as someone just asked a moment ago, um, there are some pretty significant environmental benefits by reducing waste. Um, and when it comes to things like the, um, the carbon um, or, or climate change benefits or the material um, benefits or the water saving benefits, um, it really does depend on um, the, 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 the materials that are recycled. Um, it, it depends on how far they're transported. Um, and so it de de depends on a, a range of things, but the, the federal government's done lots of work um, over a long period of time. Um, so d doing all technical studies um, that really do uh, confirm that in almost all cases, um, recycling um, has uh, great benefits compared to using um, raw materials and um, probably one of the exceptions might be um, if you were in a really remote community and you were transporting um, small volumes of recyclables hundreds and hundreds of kilometres then the, the impacts of transporting that material might be actually worse than the recycling that you can do but um, overall um, there's, there's, there's benefits so you might have to get Go and look at various studies to get the to get the details if you're interested. Um, so uh, Rebecca Brown often um, 
pokes fun at me for taking too long with presentations. So I will start. And, um, and this, this presentation isn't quite as um, fun and hasn't got as many images as Rebecca's. So, um, not, uh, so anyway, we'll get cracking. So as I said, um, uh, in Western Australia, um, we've got a waste avoidance and resource recovery strategy. And um, I won't go into too many details about that, but I think um, it's good to know that um, we've got a real strong vision um, to, to reduce waste. And, and um, you might have heard the term circular economy. We're trying to move towards a, a more circular economy. And these coag waste export bans are, are one way to help do that. Um, and it's got um, uh, objectives and targets, which um, hopefully are you know quite clear and sensible. So we're trying to first and foremost avoid the amount of waste that we generate. Um, we're trying to um, increase the amount of um, recycling or recovery um, from the waste that we do generate, and we're trying to uh, do what we can to protect the environment from the impacts of waste. Um, so I've highlighted a couple of key things there: circular economy. I'll touch on in a moment, and also um, we've got. Uh, these ambitious recycling targets um, of 75% that's the statewide target 75% by uh, 2030 um, and the latest figures that we've got they're about to be updated but the latest figures um, is that we've got a statewide um, recycling rate of around and this is solid waste um, of about 51% um, so I think that's you know we're doing reasonably well um, but there's um, a basically 50% of the waste that we generate is obviously not recycled. Um, and so we've got a fair way to go to um, increase those recycling rates up to our target of 75%. Um, and I also just mentioned, because there was a question about energy from waste, um, I'll just touch on that one. Um, and you'll see, you'll see that there's a, a target there to recover energy only from residual waste. So um, now the audio wasn't working very well for me, so Brendan might have already touched on this, but, but the idea, what we're really trying to do as a, as a state government as a, and as a community overall is we're trying to um, increase our recycling rates um, as, as much as we possibly can. And we know that with a, um, a three bin FOGO system that Rebecca talked about, um, we can get curbside recovery rates of, of around 65% there. Um, so that means that only the leftovers, um, which we call residual waste, the, the, the material that can't be recycled by um, the places like SMRC, only the residual waste um, should be going to, to waste to energy because we don't want to see perfectly recyclable materials such as you know good quality plastics and good quality paper. We don't want to see them go to waste to energy. We want to see them um, recycled back into other um, paper and plastic products. So that's the idea. Um, and then waste to energy is the, um, I guess the uh, lower down, you probably would have heard of the waste hierarchy. Waste to energy is lower down the hierarchy and um, it's arguably um, better than a landfill, um, but it's not as good as recycling. Um, so I won't go into much detail about circular economy, but um, you, you may have heard of it. And um, I just wanted to mention briefly that um, at the end of the day, it's probably, um, uh, there, there's different interpretations of circular economy, but essentially it's about trying to, first of all, keep materials circulating in the economy as, as, uh, for as long as possible. And I guess with waste to energy, um, once you send it off to an incinerator, then you know, it, 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 it no longer exists, it becomes ash, of course, just like a fire. Um, so one thing we're trying to do is just keep those materials circulating and circulating as much as possible by making a Coke bottle into ideally another Coke bottle. Um, and then you know, that process continues. Um, and I think another point about circular economy is that we're, we're really trying to recycle things locally if possible. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One of, it, uh, one of the reasons is um, if we can recycle locally, then um, we're not having to um, spend money and um, you know, use greenhouse gas emissions by um, transporting materials long distances, such, such as um, to Asia. Um, and another thing about recycling locally is that um, yeah, the, the recycling industry is actually, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty big issue industry, um, you saw the scale of machinery that um, is, you know, at SMRC there, um, it creates jobs, it creates investment opportunities, um, and, and um, there's real opportunities for uh, WA to get some economic benefits um, by recycling more materials locally. So um, there's just a couple of, couple of points about um, why the government is really keen to make Western Australia a bit more of a circular economy. 
Um, now, uh, I'll, I'll try and keep moving. Um, just, just wanted to touch, uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention really in this presentation was that um, the COAG export bans, um, obviously, you're, uh, which I think is what you're focusing on, is um, focusing on um, paper, plastics, um, glass and tyres. And um, I just wanted to sort of mention that they're uh, important and we certainly, you know, need to do things to recycle them uh, locally. Uh, but I just wanted to put for a bit of context as to, to mention that they're just some of the materials of, um, you know, that we, we in, in WA and, and around Australia, we recycle um, all sorts of materials and um, a lot of them are actually recycled locally. Um, but the, the, the materials that are um, apart from glass in the COAG export bands, so in other words, tyres, paper and cardboard, they're typically exported. So they're a real, uh, a real focus. So um, in the waste strategy, we've got these, uh, what we call focus materials, which are quite simply the things that we need to um, concentrate on if we're to achieve our waste strategy targets. And I just thought I'd sort of point out that those, so um, we've got those paper, glass and plastics, which are covered by the COAG bands and tyres. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things that we're, um, you, you know, that we, that we deal with every day that we recycle and um, they're, uh, they're, they're not covered by the, the COAG waste export bands. Now, I don't expect you to, um, just, just to show what we do recycle in WA, this here, this graph here is a, a list of all the materials that we uh, collect for recycling. And um, I don't expect you to worry about the numbers or anything. This is just really to illustrate that um, the materials that the COAG ban um, is focusing on is, is just, just part of the picture. Um, if you look to the left-hand side of the graph, um, there's some pretty big numbers there with the amount of um, things like construction and demolition waste um, and, and steel and concrete and organic material, things like that, um, that, that are recovered and recycled in, in pretty high volumes. And um, most of that's done locally because you can just imagine if you demolish a building and you've got a whole lot of building rubble left over, um, you're not going to be transporting that very far. You, you tend to recycle that locally and then reuse it locally. So this graph is really just to show a bit of a, a picture of um, how the, the COAG bands are, bands are focusing on just, you know, some of the materials that we collect for, for recycling. And probably another thing, I have, don't have a graph about it, but another thing worth mentioning is that um, just for context is that in the waste world of waste that Brendan and Rebecca and uh, we, we, we work in, um, we talk about waste being from three uh, sectors um, and that's the um, municipal solid waste, which is really the, the house, mainly the household waste and the curbside collection bins that you see and the verge side collections that you might have once or twice a year and the drop off collections that, um, that you might have. And then there's two other streams. There's uh, a stream that we call construction and demolition waste, um, which is obviously from build, building and construction activity. And that, that alone makes up nearly half of WA's waste stream, uh, really high volumes. And then there's another stream, which we, can, which we call commercial and industrial waste, which is uh, basically waste from any, any commercial premises like restaurants and offices and, and those sorts of places. So um, the, the, the stuff that um, uh, the SMRC is dealing with is, I think, um, primarily from the, um, the, the curbside collection bin as part of municipal solid waste. And I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they, they take some, um, uh, 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 sorry, I'm, I, I might have got my words mixed up there, but um, I think uh, the, the material that SMRC deals, deals with is primarily the household waste from the yellow topped bin. And I think they also take some commercial waste. Would that be right, guys? I think, yeah, I think so anyway. Yep, I got a thumbs up there. So I just wanted to mention that uh, for a bit of context because I guess what I'm saying is that the, the, the materials covered by the, the COAG ban is really important, um, but it's just one part of the, the bigger picture. Um, here's another little graph that I whipped up at, and the point of this graph is really just to show um, of all of the, um, the, of the four materials that are banned, uh, sorry, the export ban is applying to, um, the, the orange shows the um, amount of material which is exported and as Brendan said, mainly to, to Asia. Um, and the blue is the, 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 the materials that are um, recycled locally. So as you can see, um, most of our, well, I think all of our glasses is managed locally. Um, a little bit of plastic is, and, and tyres is, is recycled locally. Um, and then all of the orange bits show that there's a fair bit of um, material that's being exported. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, just a couple of points there. Obviously, um, you know, what we need is what, what that graph is telling us is um, if we're going to be exporting, uh, sorry, banning the export of those materials, the, the orange bits, clearly that's what we need local solutions for. Um, otherwise, we're uh, you're going to end up with that material and not have anything to do with it. So that's where really the focus of, of our attention um, needs to be. We need to work out, well, if we were exporting, um, you know, many tens of thousands of tonnes of paper and cardboard, what are we going to do with it locally? Um, so, yeah, there's, there's um, what, what I, uh, the, the, the next slide here just shows that... Um, uh, earlier this year, um, a document was released by the Commonwealth Government, um, and it's it, what it basically um, is showing is the commitments by both um, state and local governments to try and support the transition from those export bans to, to managing materials locally. So if you were interested in finding out more details about what what governments are actually doing to try and manage those materials, then um, that's probably a, 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 a handy little document to have a look at. Um, and just a bit of a summary there on the right of the slide is that um, WA has made some commitments to um, funding, uh, you know, providing funding, which is matched by the Commonwealth, um, and in some cases also matched by, by companies that, that, that might get the funding. Um, and so there's some pretty significant commitments to try and, um, you know, fund projects that can um, take our plastics and tyres and paper and cardboard. And as you saw from the previous graph, there's um, not a particular problem with um, glass because in WA we don't export that really anyway to any, any significant levels. Um, so just quickly, and I might go for the sake of Rebecca, I'm, I'm on the home straight, Rebecca. Um, so just... Um, so that the waste strategy is that document there if you if you're keen to look at it on the waste authority website and um, so the waste strategy itself is a, a it's, it's basically like a 10-year plan um, and each year we have an action plan that sits underneath that and the action plan says um, look here's the key things that we're we're going to do in each year that we're going to focus on to implement the strategy and so the little box to the right there is um, just a, a few examples of um, the types of actions that relate to the, or, or are relevant to the, um, the, the waste export bans. So um, th three, three examples there is that um, we've got actions around um, having better communications and messaging to help people understand how to recycle better um, and to you know, bust the myths of recycling. And one of the things the Waste Authority is doing is um, helping local councils um, to uh, make sure that we've got clear and consistent messaging for communities because um, I guess you've got 30 councils across um, Perth, Perth metro area um, and in the past there's been really different systems that each councils use. Some have one bin, some have two, some have three bin with garden only, some have three bin with FOGO and it's been really confusing. So the, the idea there is to um, have some communications to help people understand how to recycle better. Similar to the, the, the recycle right work that SMRC delivers. So they've got some really good um, clear and consistent messaging. Um, another action there is uh, procurement, which is essentially about um, purch the purchasing recycled materials. Now, um, I reckon a really key thing to um, kind of um, be aware of, I guess, in, in, in the waste and recycling world is that recycling can only work if the materials that are collected at the end actually have a home to go to. And so you saw that um, the bales of materials that SMRC produces, um, recycling only works if that material can be made into a, you know, an, another, another product. So one way governments can do that is to purchase materials such as glass and tyres and use those materials in, um, in projects. And some good examples are in construction projects. You can use those types of materials when building roads or rail networks or footpaths, car parks, you, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and the final uh, action, I guess, in the action plan is um, the commitment to provide funding um, and, and other, other sorts of projects to encourage recycling. Um, so I already showed you some of the funding commitments that the um, WA government has made. Um, and there's also some other examples there that I've got on the slide, which is the um, containers for change or container deposit um, 
system that Brendan mentioned. Um, and one reason that's um, going to be a good thing um, for recycling is because you get that clean stream of materials that um, uh, you know is so important. You, it's, um, you don't have it all mixed up with other, other sorts of junk. So um, that's one good way to get a clean stream of materials. Um, there's another uh, program called the Australian Packaging Covenant, and that's basically something that um, governments work with industry to try and you know, reduce the amount of uh, packaging in the sec out there in the world and, um, and, and make sure that, that packaging is more recyclable. So by the time it gets to the SMRC, it can actually be recycled properly. Um, and also there's some funding, um, some funding that the Waste Authority uh, offers each year. Uh, and this is the final slide, um, not, not intended to memorise it. The whole the point of this slide is that the, 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 the COAG waste export bans have been phased in um, over a period of time. And the reason for that is because if you shut the gates just on one day, then um, industry won't be ready to really manage those materials. So the idea of having a timetable is to give um, everyone time to adjust to the new arrangements. So um, it, it's been phased in over a period of time and um, they've, I, I guess, determined that paper and cardboard is going to be the most difficult challenge. So um, there's the most time um, allocated there for industry to get ready for that one. Um, governments and industry and, um, and, and everyone so that we can um, hopefully come up with some solutions to manage that material by um, July 2024. Um, that is it and thank you for your um, attention. I'm presuming that, um, that you, you, you were paying attention, but I had no idea really because everyone's on mute. So <laughs> who knows? So thanks anyway. Thanks, Scott. Well, we were definitely paying attention, that's for sure. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So it looks like John Curtin has some questions. Just unmute you. There we go. Okay. Um, how, like in uh, going forward, how is that export made of cardboard and plastic like expected to change in the next like 10, 20 years? Yeah, I think, um, I think what we'll see is um, uh, investment in new recycling factories like SMRC and also um, uh, once you saw the bale of paper and uh, that, that was in the, the slide um, in the earlier presentations, so as, as um, Rebecca and Brendan described, that material is then, um, well, it's sorted at SMRC and then it's taken to someone who actually processes that material into a, into a product. So for example, processes paper into a pulp or a fiber, which can be used in packaging or newspapers or whatever it might be, or processing the, 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 the plastic bales into, um, into to pellets or, or chips that are, that are then actually used to make products. So I think to answer your question, hopefully, is um, what we'll see is um, a whole lot of investment in um, factories and recycling infrastructure that can actually do um, all of that recycling locally, rather than sending the material off to um, Asia where um, they've, they've been doing some of that work. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so, thank you. Um, just quickly, with paper, is it similar to plastic where it can't really be upcycled? Every time you recycle it, it is downgraded. Is paper able to be, so if it was, you know, if it was pristine, I know lots of, we have lots of waste here from photocopying. Yeah. So could it be yeah. then returned into photocopy of paper or does it have to be a lesser grade? Well, no, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I think Brendan might be able to chime in here, but I'll have a crack at that one. Um, so if you've got a, um, a clean stream of paper, so for example, if you've got an office paper um, recycling system in, in, in your office, then um, that paper can typically be made into new paper, which is ideal. Um, but when you've got lower quality paper um, that might be made up of a, a, you know, it might be some paper and some packaging and a bit of this and that, then um, you're probably looking at a lower value use. You probably can't make that into to paper. That probably goes into lower quality product, lower value products like like a cardboard box or something. So um, it depends on the the quality of the the actual paper that's being recycled. Um, but paper um, is made up of a whole lot of fibres that sort of bind together. And um, they can only be recycled um, a certain amount of times because over time the, the, the fibres become um, 
looser and um, a, a more difficult to recycle um, back into a high value product. So um, I think yeah, with paper you you, you tend to it, it tends to not be able to be recycled after. So I think it's back over to Jared just to uh, do whatever you're going to yeah, do next. Sure. So thanks to John Curtin for asking those questions. Um, let's head over to Leeming Senior High School. Any questions from any of the other guys? Is I think Leeming. Can you hear us now, Leeming? I we, can. Yeah. Sorry, we've been uh, having huge yeah. problems with our audio. So. <laughs> um, so no questions from us, thank you. All right, no worries. So we'll just head over to Linwood. Any questions from Linwood Senior High School? No, we just want, want to say thanks very much to the class. We really enjoyed the uh, presentation. It's time for us to, to leave now. It's, it's been very informative, thank you. Great, thanks very much. No worries. Um, so we actually do have some questions ourselves um, for Scott. Um, you were talking about the, the COAG um, strategy and, and the plans there. Could you just explain what COAG is, just in case some of the students don't know? Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Mm. So, so Council, Council of Australian Governments, <coughs> excuse me, is um, basically all the, the Commonwealth states and territories that all come together and uh, so, so basically the Prime Minister and Premiers um, that all come together and make decisions on issues of national significance. So um, they all thought it was important enough. And I think Coag's Prime Minister and Premier together. I don't know if anyone else um, is having issues, but our, our sound is going really weird now. I think it's to do with the internet connection. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have to say it's just you guys, SMRC. You keep it freezing, is. it's really weird. Um, <laughs> but maybe it's a sign that it's Friday afternoon and the internet's yeah. saying, I want, <laughs> I want to <laughs> weekend to come. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. Well, yeah, thanks everyone for, um, for joining us today. Thanks very much for our presenters to Rebecca, Brendan and Scott. Um, Jared can just mention two more things, I think, please. Yeah, okay, so typically uh, we do take tours here at the RRRC. Okay. Um, are you right there, Scott? I'm not sure if you... There might be just a bit of a lag, sorry. Um, yeah, we do typically take tours here. Um, they're on hold at the moment just due to COVID uh, restrictions. So basically once the, the phase five easing of restrictions go ahead in WA, we'll be starting to take tours back here um, on site, um, as well as giving, uh, doing incursions as well. Um, but if Peter, um, Gordon, and also Jess, um, you have my, my contact details now. If you wanna get in contact with me, I can add you to the, the list for future our future tours registration list and I can keep you updated on, on how we're going there. And in, in the meantime, follow us on social media. We've got a Facebook um, group for Recycle Right, a YouTube channel and also Instagram. So look up Recycle Right WA. Um, yep. Uh, hi, um, we do have social media as well. So if we were to tweet or put it on Instagram, is there a hashtag that you'd like us to use? Yeah, Recycle Right and Recycle Right WA is our um, our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, yeah, so just look us up. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Thank you, awesome. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. We'll be in touch. Bye. See ya.